Chapter 17 Christ and Disease, or the Power of the Spiritual Life over the Body The highest form of existence is that of a true religious life, which, in its essence, is a harmonious union of goodness and truth, love and wisdom, benevolence and faith, in the character and activity of the individual. Where intellect and love are harmoniously united and blended, and act in perfect concordance, the resulting product is spiritual power. The omnipotence of God is the union of infinite wisdom and infinite love, or the knowing how to do what his goodness inclines him to do. He who is, in this respect, an image of God, partakes of his spiritual almightiness. When a true philosophy is taken into the mound of transfiguration and transformed into a divinely human religion, its face shines from the radiance of a higher sun and possesses a power over ourselves and others that it could not otherwise have. When philosophy and religion are combined into a harmonious unity, each adds power and influence to the other. All religion should be made scientific, and all science religious. There is no inharmony between them when both are properly understood. The attempt to demonstrate the perfect agreement and concordance of the two, which is being made by many at the present time, is a laudable one and promotive of the best interests of the race. Though to accomplish this the current religious creeds must part company with some of their irrational dogmas, and science give up many of its unproved assumptions. But this will be no loss to either, as it is only eliminating an element of weakness from each. All the most influential thinkers of the past, men who have mingled their thoughts with the current of the world's life, and given shape and direction to its historic development, have been profoundly religious men. As an example of these world-historical persons, as Neander would call them, we may mention Socrates. He was a man of a great and, in that age, unusual religious fervor and subject to those temporary exaltations of the mind which he made no great mistake in looking upon as divine visits for the higher religious activities. And the intellectual illumination that accompanies them bring the soul into a nearness to God. In this state, all divine and spiritual things lose in us their feeling of remoteness. Among the ancients, Anaxagoras, Pythagoras, and Plato were men in whom the religious element in their nature gave elevation to their intellectual range. In more modern times, we may mention Schulling, who has been called the German Plato, and Fichte, who might with equal propriety be denominated the German Socrates, and, in addition, we might name Schleiermacher and Niendorf, and even Hegel was a member of the church. In Immanuel Swedenborg we see a man in whom science and religion were so wedded as to render even a temporary divorce an impossibility. His intellect was always and everywhere religious, and in's religion was at all times intellectual. He deserves above all men of modern history the appellation of the spiritual philosopher. The system of spiritual science which is unfolded in his voluminous writings, and exemplified in his remarkable experiences, is having a silent but powerful influence in molding and modifying the religious beliefs and changing the thoughts of men, throughout Christendom, on spiritual things. This influence, though it falls upon the world as noiseless as the dews of night, will increase in the future. The founders of the great religions of the world were men in whom the intellect and the religious nature were blended more or less harmoniously. This is what gives their systems of doctrine such an almost unyielding grasp upon the minds of men, and such influence over so great masses of the world's population. Such men were Confucius, Buddha, Zoroaster, and we may add Muhammad. In all those examples which we have given of spiritual power there is some common principle. Can we discover what it is? It is that they were men of strong intellect, and were profoundly religious men. They were religious, not superficially, not in momentary and transient moods, but all through their being. Their religious fervor transported them into the third heavens, but also carried the intellect with it into a divine realm of life and thought. Hence their thoughts, when given to others in their writings, have a divine warmth and spiritual vitality in them, and are not mere cold and logical intellectual conceptions, like moonbeams reflected from polar ice. The religious nature exalted the intellect to a divine realm of thought, where they became inspired, and recipient of the living word, the indwelling logos, of which they became in a true sense the incarnations. In all such men, in a mitigated sense, the Word is made flesh and dwells among us. It is impossible to be spiritual in our intellectual conceptions without being religious. To reach the higher degrees of inspiration, or quickened intuition, without a fervor of religious feeling is as impossible as to fly without wings. The highest example in human history of the perfect union of the intellect with the religious nature, and the resultant spiritual power, is seen in Jesus the Christ. In Him there was the most intimate blending of the purely human and the truly divine, 
so that in his personality where the human nature ended and the divinity commenced no one can perceive. The boundary line between the Godhead and manhood is not clearly drawn. There is in him a deification of humanity and a humanization of God, and somehow in him God comes very near to the souls of men. In him we witness the spectacle of a human nature and soul filled with God, with all the fullness of God. But he expected and expressed the wish that all his disciples in every ago should be. In this respect, a copy of the Master, that they should be one with God as whole, and the Father were one. As the highest representation of God in human history, there is in his life, as unfolded in the Gospels, a revelation of the thoughts and feelings of God. No man can be actuated by a divine influence and a flatus without in some way, and to some extent, manifesting the feelings of the deity. But Paul L. affirms that God gave the Spirit to the Christ without measure, and the divine love was the motive power of all his activity. He spent a large fraction of his public life in the cure of all manner of sickness and disease among the people. His activity seemed naturally to take that beneficent direction. So far as the Christ principle is in us, we shall have power to do the same. The drift and current of our inner life will exhibit itself as a spontaneous impulse to do good to the souls and bodies of men. Jesus seemed to have a divinely clear conception of the spiritual origin of disease and of the efficacy of spiritual remedies in its cure. He did not look upon sickness of the flesh as the real disease, but as the effect of an a priori spiritual malady, and when this antecedent cause ceases to operate, the morbid effect comes to an end. As Jesus the Christ was perpetually moved by a divine influence and impulse in his career as the great physician, it shows that in God there is a perpetual conatus, an irrepressible endeavor, an unchangeable willingness to heal our diseases of mind and body. In all our struggles against every morbid condition, within and without, we can, with unerring certainty, count upon God and His omnipotent love as our unfailing ally in the battle with evil and suffering. If God be for us, what can prevail against us? Here is the standing ground of an assumed and unyielding faith in Him for the cure of our own sicknesses and those of others through us. If I have any understanding of the system of the Christ and the cure of disease, He found the cause of it in some prior disturbance of the spiritual principle in man, and He applied His healing power to the mental root of the malady. All his mighty works had a redemptive aim, that is, they were designed primarily to deliver men from spiritual evil. Matter was viewed by him as an unsubstantial appearance, and mind was the only reality. Through the restored and redeemed soul he healed the body of its diseases, both functional and organic. To illustrate his divine method of cure, and to make it an available, practical system, will be the aim of all I have to say in the subsequent chapters of this volume.